and we're just kind of tidying up our Faces series, which I've really enjoyed a lot. You, Pastor Carl? I actually have really enjoyed this Faces series. Yeah. I've, I've liked it all. I, I didn't know exactly where we're going to go with it. I just thought we'll pick some people that are in the story. Like when you read about Easter, there's people there. Like Jesus didn't get crucified and raised in a vacuum. It was in a real context, a real place with real people. Yeah, who real were really friends, impacted real disciples, by it. real yeah. family, real, real people affected yeah. by that. Like Jesus had friends yep. who were impacted by what happened. They watched their friend. They watched you know, somebody who they'd, they'd invested their life in. They watched, like Mary, whose life was transformed, saw him you know, crucified. Mary, uh, Mary His mother. Uh, of Bethany understood what was going on. She baptized him with, uh, with, with just oil. oil and perfume. And man, I just, I just love all these stories. And they have just been so When you read fun. the Bible, you should really try and put yourself in the people's shoes yeah. and really see yourself there because there, there's actually characters in the Bible mm. and there's actually things that you can learn from these characters. Truth. And it's a very real story. Yeah. It's a very real um, happening. Anyways, we're going to kind of tidy up our thing with um, two guys on the road to Emmaus. You know, sometimes there's a bit of a misnomer about this whole idea of pursuit, that it's all our responsibility to pursue God. And that our pursuit for um, holiness and intimacy and everything is dependent upon us. But I believe that God is forever and always pursuing us. Amen? And that there's a constant move from heaven and a constant call from heaven to the lost and even to those who have lost their way. Your goodness is running after. It's running after. Are you going to sing all through this? I don't know. I just thought that was good. And there's plenty of scripture to support this. You know, we got uh, the Father seeking those who would worship. We talk about that in the New Testament. That God scans the heavens and looks to, or scans the earth from heaven. That his eyes are running to and fro, seeking those that he might strengthen. We find Jesus telling us that he's come to seek and save the lost. And that he's the great shepherd who would leave the 99 to go find the one. And that God is like the Father who is incessantly looking at the horizon to see the prodigal return. God is portrayed as a pursuer in by the psalmist when he says, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And what does that word follow me mean, Pastor Carl? It's the Hebrew word radaf. 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 And the principle of interpreting scripture is first usage, first places. And this word is first used in Genesis 14. And in Genesis 14, you've got Lot and his family are being taken captive by this, this king and this ruler. And Abraham pulls together all those who were trained in his household, all those who had his DNA, who, who knew his purpose. And it says, and they went after, it says, and they went in a pursuit and they recovered Lot and they recovered all and brought him back and restored everything. So first usage means if it's going to be used that way, that's how it should be used. So, so the goodness and mercy of God is always in hot pursuit of you. Mm -hmm. I mean, always. And it, you know, I used to think like, how come it's staying behind me? I want it to finally catch up with me. How many want the goodness of God to catch up with you? Well, stop running so hard. You know, <laughs> I love it that it's chasing me down. It's going to yeah, and I love me. that, mm. you know, it's not just dependent on my good behavior. I could be, you know, stuck in sin. I could be wayward. I could be uh, living a life of failure. And I know that the steadfast love is pursuing every single one of us. Amen. Yes, amen. If you're here today and you don't think God's steadfast love is pursuing you, you're wrong. Yeah. Because he has been pursuing you from yes. heaven from eternity. It says in Ephesians, it said from the foundations of the world, he's determined that you would be in Christ and experience his love. To satisfy his great love. To satisfy you his great love. You have never lived an unloved moment. Amen. You. You, you, you remember that. Amen. You have never and never will live an unloved moment. God's love for you is without conditions. He's hunting you down. Boom. The steadfast love of the Lord is hunting you down. He is going to sing. I am going to sing. All right. There's this uh, quote from John McGuire I want to share. It says, we are objects of a search directed towards us. It says, God is always and everywhere reaching out for us, nudging us back into the sheepfold or into our futures, gluing together the shards from what was shattered mm. to offer us something useful, something beautiful, usually not on our schedule and usually not the way that we would imagine. And A.W. Tozer said this, he Read said Pastor this. Carl. He said, we need never shout across the spaces to an absent God. God, where are, where you? are you? We need never to do that because he is nearer than our own soul, closer than our own most secret thoughts. Always and everywhere God is present and always he seeks to discover himself to each one of us. 
Amen. I love that he Man. seeks to be discovered by us. Yes, he does. You know? Yeah. I love that. He's all over us. Yeah. He's yes. all over it. Mm-hmm. Very yes. good. All right. These are the guys. These the are the guys. Two guys on the road to Emmaus. These are the guys. And so we're going to finish up our faces with uh, looking at these two guys. And they had just witnessed a horrific, horrific. scene, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The one they'd hoped Their in. Their friend. The one they'd they hoped that everything. Jesus would bring about yeah. political change. Um uh, spiritual change. They that thought he would, he'd abolish the Romans. He just set up his kingdom. That it was just going to be Caesarossa. It was going to be so beautiful. I don't know Caesarossa. That's a. I don't know what that's all. I don't about. know what that just is. Just slipped either. into my head. Yeah. You know, just. <laughs> <laughs> their hopes and their expectations were just shattered. Shattered. Jesus, yeah. who was end to end slavery, rescue the least, yes. rescue the last, yes. rescue the lost, yes. suddenly and abruptly was no Boom. more. Murdered. Murdered. Awful. Crucified Horribly. on the cross. Ugly. With thieves. In Messy. Uh, ugly. Done. Yeah. Ugly. Shattered dreams. Shattered hopes. And they completely had lost hope. Lost hope. William Barclay says this when he's describing that portion of scripture. He says, you know, as they walked, it was like their faces were twisted by grief. Twisted by grief. Mm -hmm. What's that look like, Cheryl? Well, all I can imagine is when my dad no, passed no, show away. Me, show me. No, face, I twist. think I'll cry if I think about that. Oh, so I won't think Lord about Jesus. that. But you think about how grief can twist your face and your eyes are bloodshot. They could be puffy and closed and, and just everything looks horrific. Mm. You know, when my dad was passing, we hadn't slept for like a couple of days. I looked like an old hag. But, you know, and everything Never. was just so prevalent. It was so real on my face that we were going That's to something grief. something bad had happened. Yeah. Yeah. So grief, that's how they felt. That's how they were walking. They were twisted with grief. And they'd lost their hope. And you know, we all have hopes. We have hope that we find a good mate. We have hope that we have children, that our children might come back to Jesus, that we get out of poverty, that we get out of soul-crushing debt, that we, you know, get free from our addictions. We all have hopes. But when dreams go unfulfilled and hopes are shattered, it's discouraging and sometimes devastating. And that's exactly where we find these two guys on yes. the road to Emmaus. Yeah. Yeah, Proverbs 13, 12 says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a dream fulfilled is a tree of life. That is the saddest death of all is the death of hope when your hope is gone. When, when you lose and your expectations are shattered and you just give up on a hope and a dream. And it's not that hope is ever not present. Hope is always present. But, you know, you can be so... Um, so ruined by discouragement and disappointment that you can't see the hope that's around you or the light that's around you. But hope is always present. But to you in a moment or to you in, the, in a situation where life is just beating you up, it can seem like it's gone and it's dead. Yeah, it's deferred. Eh? It's, it's deferred. deferred. It's like it's, it's, always, it's always never happening. Yeah. Deferred. Hope deferred. Deferred. Yeah. Very good. Okay, we're going to read uh, a little portion of Luke chapter 24, verse 13 to 35. So you go ahead and start, Pastor. Now Paul. behold, behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus. Now Emmaus means warm bath. And that same day was the day that um, the women had gone to the tomb to deal with stuff and Jesus was gone and they had a vision of an angel saying he's no longer here go tell it to the other guys but they're shattered it's a mess now they didn't travel on Sunday because it's a Sabbath and you can't walk on the Sabbath you can't take long walks it's a seven mile walk so they had to hang sit out in their and grief. wait and they had to sit and sink in their grief and just the picture of the person they'd pursued and given their whole life to was taken in a horrible just tragic violent way and uh, they've been sitting in that and soaking in that for a day. And now they're headed going, let's go to Emmaus. Let's go have a nice warm bath, put on some candles, and listen to some Van Morrison. You know what I mean? <laughs> I don't know if it was really like that, but that's okay. You can think of it oh, however sorry. you want. <laughs> so it was seven miles from Jerusalem, and they talked together. And as these things were happening, so it was, while they were conversing and reasoning, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them but their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him and that's really interesting that you know they were disciples you know they say well they'll say later on in the scripture he was a good prophet a good man mighty in works and mighty indeed before god and yet at that moment in time they could not see him discouragement disappointment yeah. despondency has a way of blinding you to yeah. the things of god Shut down no matter how Boom. it could be standing right in front yeah. of you and you couldn't see hope and you couldn't see light but it's there you yeah. just got to open your eyes Amen. Go ahead. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you are having with one another as you walk and are so sad? sad? What's going on? I love then that the Jesus one of them was kind of did that, that you're so sad. 
Why are you so sad? Why are you so sad? Anyways, go ahead. Cleopas answered him. Now listen to this. He says, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem and you have not known the things that happen there these days? Like, are you the only person? Meaning that everybody knows what just went down. Everybody knows what just happened. There's, there's some, some million and a half people who gathered for that feast. And what happened? The whole city was shaken. There's not a person that missed this whole thing and what went down. Are you the only person? I mean, we're leaving town and you're traveling home going where you are. Are you the only stranger who visited town who doesn't know what happened? Because this wasn't done in a corner, done in a little box, done in some little void. It was done in a way that was very, very public. It was, it was massive in its implications. It was huge. Are you the only one who That's didn't it. know what was going on, these things? Where are you going? Are you, oh, you, uh, pushing my, went... are you pushing my button? <laughs> I'm, I'm pushing your button. But he said to them, what things? <laughs> So they said them the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth. So he's saying everybody, everybody was impacted by this Jesus of Nazareth. He was a prophet, mighty in deed and in word before God and all the people. And how the chief priests and rulers delivered him to be condemned to death. He was crucified. But, but we, we were, were hoping. hoping. Past tense. We were hoping. hoping that this was it that this would lead to a significant trial and change and a breakthrough, that he was the one who's going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since all these things happened. And yes, listen, certain women of our company arrived at the tomb and they astonished us when they did not find his body. Then they came saying that they'd seen a vision of angels, that he was alive. These women, hey? My God. And then certain of those who were there with him at the tomb, they found it there was empty as the women had said, but they did not see they did not see. Then he said to them, oh, you poor people, cheer up. Everything's going to be okay. Oh, you foolish ones, slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets You think they would kind spoken. of notice that because that was language Jesus had used before. You think they would kind of like wake up to see that, yeah. that the scales would come off but their you eyes. you think Jesus would show a little more empathy, you know? Like these guys are sad, well, it depends on how you define grief, empathy. and then he says, you fools. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Anyways. Go ahead. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things to enter his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures concerning the things him. concerning himself. So the living word went from beginning, from, from Genesis all the way through to Malachi. All the way through, from Genesis to Malachi. And he revealed himself. If you're reading the Old Testament, what you should be looking for is it's not Jesus. crazy weird signs and stuff to try to interpret wrong. You need to see Jesus. You need to see the goodness of God. When Jesus interprets the word, he reveals himself. You should see Jesus on every page because that's why it was written. So listen, wouldn't that be amazing to have a seven-mile walk? I'd be getting tired about walk. <laughs> but a seven mile walk, walk. And Jesus, the living word is taking them through On a journey. the word, mm -hmm. revealing the word. himself. himself. Mm -hmm. He starts with Adam and he starts with the revelation. He starts with the prophecy of, you know, there's going to be that snake and all that stuff. But listen, and he one promised will come who will one crush will come who would crush the snake's head. head. I mean, all through, he starts to break down and starts to show them that Jesus started to show them himself everywhere in the text. It must have been amazing. Mm -hmm. And it says that, that they were going and indicated, look what he says. It says, they drew near the village and Jesus acted like, he peace out, go. dude, yeah. have fun, see ya. And he's about to keep on walking. They said, whoa. Wait a minute. That was intense. Hang well, out with stay us. with us. Yeah, hang out with mm -hmm. us a little. They said, abide with us, for it's toward evening, and the day is far spent. And they went, and they stayed with them. Now, it came to pass as he sat at the table with them, and that they took bread. We're going to break bread today. We're yep. going to do that. And they took bread, and they broke it, and blessed. he blessed as he broke it, and he gave it to them to eat. Then... Their, Their eyes, eyes were open, open and they knew him. I love it. So many places he was revealed in the breaking of the bread. And I pray he'd be revealed to you today in the breaking of the bread. Mm -hmm. I pray for a revelation of healing, of breakthrough, delivery. Freedom comes in the breaking of the bread. And they knew him and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, did not our hearts burn? Amen. How many get heartburn when I preach? It's biblical. It's biblical. Hearts burn within us when he talked to us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us. So they rose up that very hour. They turned around. They just had a seven-mile walk. It was nighttime. It was the end of the day. And instead, they turned around and said, boom, I'm going back into my destiny. They turned around. They returned to Jerusalem. They found the 11 who were gathered there. And they said, the Lord is risen indeed. And they appeared to Simon. And they told them about the things that had happened to them along the road, how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. 
And so, you know, there's a lot of things that you can glean from this story. You could actually spend a lot of time preaching on this story, but we just want to kind of draw your attention to really one important point. Well, maybe three. Three. Yeah. That Jesus is the face of restoration the for these guys. And Jesus is the face of yes. restoration for you and yes. I. If our expectations have been shattered yes. or broken, he is the face of restoration to us. If our hopes and dreams have been obliterated, he's still the face of restoration to us because Jesus has decided to join us in journey with us. Amen? Amen. The first thing is he joins with. And, you know, the, the scripture in verse 14 says, he drew near. And that word is actually ang igzo that's the greek word for to join to one another to be at hand to position yourself with them it's like gluing two blocks of wood or it's like using gorilla super glue and if you ever use gorilla super glue and you get it stuck in your hand and stuck on whatever you're gluing it to god help you it's very difficult to get your, your finger unglued to something and so a spiritual way of saying this is like we are in union with Christ. Yes. We are glued to Jesus. He has chosen forever and ever to be united with you and I. God's desire was to become a man and then to make us like himself. Yes. Amen. He has joined himself to us. And yeah, we're talking about restoration. Can you say restoration? Restoration. I mean, if you've lost anything or felt like something is missing or a hope or a dream is shattered, can you say restoration? Restoration. God is a God of restoration. That's what he does. And to us to embrace restoration, we really got to get this one thing down. God is completely in union with us. Yes. One of my favorite verses, 1 Corinthians six seventeen. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Like you are straight up, you are one spirit with God. You don't come and go. You don't have better days, closer days, further away days. You know, days when I, I just feel close to God today. Whether you feel it or not, it doesn't matter. You are one spirit with God. You can't get any closer than you are right now. You might have more awareness of your closeness. Your awareness might come and go, but your closeness doesn't come and go. It is established once and for all. You are one spirit. You are absolute in union with God. He'll never leave you, never forsake you. He's always right and there. This was a theme that was ran all through a Paul, all through Paul's yes. writings. Actually, this whole idea of in union or one spirit with him, he kind of alluded to over 164 times in his yes. epistles. So that whole idea of being in union with God, it's in the, the dissoluble. It's, it's binding, it never ends, it doesn't break, and it's permanent. We are permanently in union with Christ, amen? Yeah. And so um, if I'm in union with someone and I'm glued to them and I'm stuck to them, then I'm obviously going to journey with them. Oh, okay. Do you need something in between services? Uh -oh. I'm stuck on you. I did. I had a couple of cookies. <laughs> so I know this is a silly illustration. No, it's a dream come true. <laughs> I didn't hear that. Yes. <laughs> but Christ is in union with us. It, it, we are inseparable. There's no exchange. Like, you know, if I'm in union with Christ, I'm, my life is hid with God in Christ Jesus. Can you see me? That's right, because I'm in union with him. And where I go, he has to go. I don't know. I think I'm first. If I'm going to fall... Well, I only did that. <laughs> Whoa. Wow. I got dizzy there. <laughs> but where one goes, the other has to go. And you can go over the edge and be ready to fall off. And he's there with you. No matter what road you go, no matter what journey you go, no matter what comes, he is with you. Amen? We are jointly connected. Wow. He's glued to me. He w we should have done oh. that face to face, honey. What's that? We should have done that oh, face to face. That? Did you that's hear? just too much. That was, she said, that's really weird. <laughs> so he is joined together with us. And so that means when he's joined together with us, he's going to follow us. He's going to journey with us. Yeah. Where I go, he goes. And it doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter where I go. Don't matter where you go. I could go to a if bad you go, place. He said, if you go to me. the depths of hell, I'm there. 
if, where there's not a single place you can go where God. The psalmist said it great. He said, he "Where did. can I go from where your presence, from God? Your presence? If I ascend into the heights, you are there with me. If I make my bed in Shoal, you're there with me. If I'm in the uttermost parts of the sea, you're with me. If I sit in darkness, you're there with me." That's one of the lies of religion. Is religion says that God's with you based on your behavior. If you're behaving good, He's close to you. If you're behaving bad, He leaves you, and that's rubbish. You need, you need to know that right there in the middle of what you're doing, he's still right there. Right while you're doing that, you just got to say, how you doing, big fella? Exactly. And, and you, he'll have a conversation with you. How's this working for you? Like, what's going on here? And you got to know that he didn't go away. You can't push him out of your experience. He's right there. I love that. Always there. You know? That is so moving. It's true. And I could go into a bad place in my own mind and be discouraged and feel despondent. And he's still there with me. Isaiah, what is it? Isaiah what? It, Isaiah 57, it says, which one? The one that says, uh, I've seen your willful ways, ways but and I yet I will heal you. To show people my compassion. Yes, like, like, you know, you say, well, but I willingly did it. I willingly withdrew. Whoopie doo. Did you hear God's love is unconditional? Like you can do something where you think, I must have really ticked them off. His now. love supersedes your stupidity, Boom. let's face it. It really does. Amen? Yeah. And that's good news. And so he's journeying with us. I love the scripture says, and he went with them. He, went he with knew them. what was going on. Yeah. He knew what had happened. It was yeah. happened to him. Yeah. But he decided to join himself with them. And then he decided to journey yeah, with he, them. They are on purpose walking away from his commands to their lives. They are in disobedience to what Jesus had told them to do. They're in absolute. They have moved. They're going the opposite direction of his purpose for their lives. And Jesus catches up with you. It was like he was on, like on purpose, going to get purpose. them. So those guys had yes. something to do, something yes. to fulfill that Jesus was not going to do is with them. He committed to His purpose. I in love your life. that. Yes. And you know, journey implies more than just a walk. Like I can go for a walk with Carl, which is sort of painful because he's a slow walker. <laughs> I try to slow the, the pace down in my head, but it's really, really difficult. And we can go on a walk together, but it doesn't mean we're having a journey together because we might not talk. I'm usually far ahead of him and just waiting around the corner for him. But journeying with somebody is very different. It implies change. It implies transition. It implies yeah. challenges. And it even implies um, adventure. And so when God journeys with us, he does two things. He, well, he does a lot of things, but he engages us and he instructs us. Go he ahead, does. Pastor Carl. He engages us. Like he says, why are you so sad? Yeah. Have you ever had those conversations? David did. He, David spoke to himself and said, why so downcast? Oh, my soul. Put your hope in God. I mean, there's times praise like he the actually Lord said the words. Him. Why are you yeah. so sad? Why are you so sad? Why, why are you so sad? sad? Why are you so sad? I love that. Yeah. I love that he already knew it, and I love that he actually said it, and I love the fact that he gave them permission to voice their disappointment and their discouragement. Because, you know, half the time, you, the enemy keeps you in bondage when you don't give voice to your disappointment True. and your discouragement, yeah. but Jesus gives you permission to share your disappointment, to share your discouragement, and to share the source of your sadness. But he doesn't just, you know, fall in the hole with us. He then instructs us. And I love that the way, the way he dealt with their dilemma was to reveal himself. The way he dealt with the dilemma was to break open the word and show them revelation. And that revelation turned and caused their hearts to burn, caused their passion to return, broke them free of their disappointment, and they began to turn and walk into their destiny. So It's great when you're in those kind of yeah. moments where you feel kind of really crappy, and all of a sudden the word starts to come to your spirit. You yeah. start thinking about all the goodness of God. He's faithful to me. His goodness is running. And after me, the steadfast love of the God pursues me. When you're in a dark place and those things start to come to you, it actually does inspire yes. you and it encourages you and it instructs you. Amen? Yes. Amen. Amen. In the midst of our despondency, despair, and disappointment, Jesus will journey with us come what may. The Mayus Road reminds us of many things that we are loved, supported, guided, and thankfully instructed along the way. He's journeying with us even though we don't recognize him. Amen? And you know that you dark, like desperation, depression, um, disappointment, it can really jade the way you look at things. Um, it can almost like put a scale over your eyes so you can't see anything. But I know that God is always there. I remember um, they said in the scripture, they said, did not our hearts burn? Did not our hearts burn. And so they still hadn't recognized him. Yeah. Even while he was taking them on this trip through the Old Testament to reveal himself in the Old Testament, it wasn't until after the breaking of bread and then that goes, oh, our hearts were burning while he was saying that. And so it's sort of like us when we get saved 
And we look back and go, oh my gosh, Jesus was there all the time. I can point to moments when I know that it was the hand of God who saved me from something. I, can, I know that God was there when I got on the motorcycle of someone who'd been drinking. I know that God was there when my dad tried to commit suicide. Like, I can look back now and see the hand of God and recognize that he was there all along. Amen? True. But here's, here's one thing really important. This is just really important. After doing all that, after revealing himself and doing all that he did, he was about to carry on. And I've seen so many people, even, even when they were in the boats and was in the water and they were pulling at the oars, Jesus was about to pass them by. Like Jesus walks into your circumstance. Jesus reveals himself. But ultimately, after waves and waves of revelation of his goodness, you still have to choose, stay with me. You yeah. still have to choose to take that word and say, I believe that you've got to say, I, in light of this wonderful revelation, and here's where you do need to repent. Here's where you really do need to repent. You need to change your mind now. In light of this, in light of the mercy of God, what are you going to do? I'm going to offer my body a living sacrifice. In light of the mercy of God, Jesus poured out revelation to those, those two sad people, and they had to choose, we're not going to be sad anymore. And they were able to do that because yes. he had joined himself with them, because he had journeyed with them, and because he had engaged and instructed them all along the way. And so they were able to make that decision that, oh my gosh, what am I doing going seven miles in the opposite direction? Yes. So Jesus is the face of restoration. He restores us. He returns us to something earlier, a better condition and a good Truth. condition. Truth. So they return to Jerusalem. I love that. So God is committed to putting Humpty Dumpty back together again. Cheryl thought that was pretty funny in the first place. I tried service, not to look. But I told her not to do that again. So anyways. <laughs> He's committed to putting Humpty Dumpty back. He refuses to leave things broken. He really does. And he is gonna, he's going to go really hard after you for restoration. How many like restoration shows? You watch HGTV. Who watches HGTV? Anybody in the front row? Jen, who watches? Who doesn't have a TV? Who doesn't watch TV because you're holy and pure? Amen. Thank you. Amen. Well, I actually like, I, I like the shows where they, you get the rotten, messed up house and they clean it up. That's great. I mean, I sometimes go and look at it on recordings and I f can fast forward to the end, right? Who cares about how they did it? I just want to see the change, right? And then even rest, I like car restoration shows. I love watching old cars that they turn into these beauties. I just want that one. Rust one. I love that. Though they find this thing in a, a field someplace and they turn it into a beauty. It's just so awesome. You know what? God is absolutely committed to your restoration. Amen. He really is. He's going to come into any broken situation in your life. He is absolutely committed. He is committed to restoration. Who wants some restoration? Amen. I'm telling you, God is committed to restoration. And this is really, really good news. And he'll never let you walk alone. No. Amen. No. I just love the fact that Jesus pursues the tax collector, the Pharisee, the sinner, the saint, yes. the outcast, the rejected, and the respected, yes. those who need deep forgiveness. He, he comes after the rule breakers, but he also chases the rule keepers. Yeah. He chases those who have lost their way, who lose their hope, and he's right there in the midst of it. I love it. He, he took a long walk. He, he ministered to somebody here, and then he says, we got to go. And he took a long walk, and he had to go to Nain, and he got there just in time. And a woman was coming out of the gate, and a whole parade of mourners, she who was a widow, had lost her only son. This was a horrible, broken situation, but Jesus showed up just in time. He walked up to the coffin and he touched it and they went because ah! if you touch the coffin you're dead you, you just touch dead things you're, you're unclean, unclean jesus you're unclean but jesus walked over and you know what in the new covenant you can touch death and bring life in the old covenant if you touch death it got on you but we got a new covenant so you know what the messy stuff don't get on you the anointing in you shatters every yoke so he walked up and he said son boom he pulls him up and gives him back to mom that's his god is a god of he's so restoration. faithful and we got to believe for that today i know sometimes Sometimes you go, oh, those Bible stories are so nice, but I know somebody who lost, who lost, who experienced death, experienced grief. We got to start believing. We need restoration today. We don't want to have the best miracles be Bible stories. We want the best miracles to be the one I heard from my friend last week in church. We want to see them today. We need to see restoration now. We need to see those breakthroughs today. Amen. Amen. That's amen, good. Amen, Pastor Cheryl. That's good, Pastor. Come on. That's give me good. an amen over there. <laughs> I love the fact that Jesus will never leave us nor forsake. Never. Us, amen. He said, I will never, 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 no, never. leave you nor forsake yes. you. I thank God that when I sit in darkness, I'm not sitting alone. I thank God that he is my strength and my portion. And I thank 
thank him that nothing shall separate me from his love. Yes. Amen. Neither height nor depth nor principality nothing. nor power nor nothing. things present nor things nothing. to come can separate me Not from the yourself. love of God. You know why? Because if God is for me, who can who be can against me? me? Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Nothing can extinguish nothing. that flame and that passion God has for you and I today. In Luke 4, 18, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, heal the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, sight to the blind, set at liberty those who are oppressed. I mean, that's the gospel. The gospel is taking broken lives and seeing restoration and seeing people put back together. And if I think about this story, then the challenge to me as a believer and, and looking at this story is that I need to join with people. I need to join myself to people. I need to journey with them. I need to give them permission to tell their story. I need to help them see that they can be caught up in the story of God. Amen. Amen. And that they are a part of the story of God. Yes. Go ahead. Psalm 139 says, I will praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your, are your works and my soul knows that. You are marvelous. You are beautiful. You are fantastic. God created you for significance and significant things. And you got to know that deep inside of you that something powerful was established. Micah 7, 8 says, when I sit or when I walk, I might have put myself there. I might have sat there in a place of darkness, but you know what? The, the Lord, Lord will, will be, be a light, light to me. Yeah. Let the Lord be a light to you. If you got, if you got dark thoughts, dark thoughts, things, dark circumstances, dark stuff that's trying to encroach on you and trying to separate you from the goodness of God. If you're saying some situations are too hopeless, that is not God. Yeah. And sometimes bad stuff happens to really, really good people. But you know what? That's not the way it should be. And we got to resist that. You know, we got to show empathy and compassion whenever it happens. But we got to realize this is not the order of God. And we got to start believing and contending for restoration and breakthrough. The next great thing isn't God gets me out of this mess. The next great thing is we see heaven more and more manifest in our world, more and more expressions of his divine life and power and wisdom every where we are. I was just waiting for you to take a breath there. <laughs> Did you because intercede? Because scriptures, John, or Jesus said, you know, he says, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but, but I've come, come to give, give you life, life and life, life more, more abundantly. abundantly. The enemy will always try to steal. He's always going to try to kill your joy. He's always going to try and bring a death to your hope. But Jesus Christ has come to give you life and life more abundantly. Amen. 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 And we are, we're in a restoration mission right now. We're, that's what we're doing. And we might still be grinding rust off of things. We might still be straightening frames. It might still be look like a broken window. We might still be waiting for parts to show up. But I'm telling you, we're going to see the end. We're going to see the finished product. Impact Church is going to be a place where we see God really put lives back together. Amen. And the world needs to see it in a big way. The world needs to, I love Kenneth Hagin said, ring, 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 ring. He said, healing is the dinner bell saying, come on home. Home. The table is full. We need to get people into a place where we are contending. I want to get on. I want to stand and get on an elevator with somebody in a wheelchair. And by the time we get to the 10th floor, they're healed. Mm -hmm. I want to walk through Walmart and see people trying to find where I am so my shadow will touch them and heal them. Amen. I don't want the stories in the Gospels and the story in the book of Acts to be more powerful in my life. Because he's a God of the increase of his government and peace will be no end. Amen. It says that I don't just get health. I'm not trying to get health for myself. It says when you know God and you walk in his ways, you radiate health. Have you ever been by a radiator? Have you ever stood by? We used to have heat radiators in our home. And I'd walk over sometimes when it was cold and just lean on the radiator because it was radiating heat. Wherever you go, you radiate health. You walk in a room and people are touched and transformed. You just sit there at work in your little office and everybody around you is getting more healthy because you're there. Amen. Amen. God is a God of restoration. And we got to start to believe that for ourselves. We got to start to get our head. We got to repent and get our minds around who we really are in God so we can loose the rivers of his goodness and greatness and manifest that today. I mean, what a terrible thing for the church to be powerless and hopeless True. and be stuck in despair just like everybody else. You know what? Sometimes we lose. Sometimes it's ugly. But I'm not going to let that happen. I'm going to shake that off and we're going to believe for better things. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. <laughs> but you know, if you quit walking so far ahead of me, you could be close and you could feel the life of God. <laughs> I could feel it. Could you feel it? Yeah. The heat was just pulsating could you feel this that? way. Yeah, just don't spit on me. Okay. Hey, the spit of the firstborn has yeah, healing properties. You're not the firstborn. I'm not the firstborn, that's true. So. We are brokers of hope, amen? 
We are brokers of restoration. That's our responsibility. That's our privilege. That's our duty now. Amen. So Zechariah 9 verse 11 to 12 says this. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant covenant. with you, I will free you from, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. I will return you to your fortresses and you will be prisoners of hope. Amen. We are prisoners of hope. We are dispensers and brokers of hope. I'm locked down. I mean, that's all I got. I mean, I'm literally trapped in the realm of hope. It's just hope. Hope. And look what it says. And even now I announce that I I will will restore restore twice as much to you. See, God, God, you don't just get your stuff back with God. You get get twice as much. You get more. God doesn't just just get you back a little. I mean, you look at what happened with Job, right? Look at Job. Job ended up with way more. Mm -hmm. Restoration is getting way more than what you lost. How many are stepping into some restoration? How many had some stuff stolen from you? Uh, I'm not even going to participate in this. It's just going to make me sad. Repent. I, I know what it's like to feel like I can't hope again. But you know what? Man, I'm telling you, God wants to restore. God wants to bless you. God wants to bring you into a breakthrough. So it says, you know what? It says he was revealed in the breaking of the bread. bread. You got your emblems. We're going to take communion. Communion is common union. We have common union with Christ. That's, you've got to get that on a cellular level because you know, the, the hits from the enemy or your friends, your family, whatever, they come at you every single day. But you got to know on a cellular level that I am in co-union with Christ. I know that he walks with me. I know that he is joined to me. And there's nothing that we can't face together. Amen. Come on, stand up with me. Come on, stand up. Has everybody got, everybody got emblems? You got emblems? You got, if you don't have any, wave your hand right now. We can get you some. You've all got some. Desmond's looking around, so you got to wave your hands. Is there a hand over there? Anywhere? Anything over there? All right. Now listen, if you say, man, I just wandered in. I don't know what's going on. Listen, Jesus loves you. He's nuts about you. He forgave your sins. He healed you. He delivered you. It was done 2,000 years ago. You don't need to do any heavy lifting. He did it all. You just have to say thank you. You see, that's what salvation is. Salvation isn't a uh, exchange. It's not a transaction. Salvation is a person. It's Jesus. Yeah. And Jesus saves you. Jesus heals you. And what you got to do is say, thank you. See, what do you say to good news? Say, thank I'll you. have some. And so right now, if you've never done that, right now in Jesus' name, just say, thank you, Jesus, for being my Savior. I receive you right now in Jesus' name. See, because this isn't New Life, New Life Center. <laughs> This isn't New Life Center's table. This isn't Impact Church table. It's not even the table of some, you know, religious organization. This is, I want the you to encounter table. Jesus right now. It's the table of the Lord. It's the Lord's table. And he invites you to come. Now, what he wants us to do is he wants us to remember, not, doesn't want us to feel sad and commiserate. He wants us to remember right now that every disease, every sickness, everything that would hinder you from the revelation of your father was put in his body. And in his body, he took all sin, all sickness, all depression, all disease, all of that. That is the truth. Amen. And he took it. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to say yes to that. And we're going to eat this. And we're going to expect. Now, here's, here's what happens when you don't eat with expectation. You get no results. It says many don't believe. And that's why many are still sick. And many still sleep. And you see, the judgment isn't that you're going to go to hell. The judgment is what you don't believe won't happen. But when you believe, when you agree, when you say yes, when you eat this with understanding, when you examine your heart and say, I want all unbelief, I want all disbelief, I want it to go, I agree. He says, put me in affectionate remembrance of my promises. Mm -hmm. And so let's with affection say, I thank you that I'm forgiven, I'm healed, and I'm free. In Jesus name thank you for the body that was given for me that bore every single bit of brokenness and I eat now to absolute health and healing in Jesus name amen and so we're gonna drink today and we're gonna thank God because the blood speaks a better word over me amen the blood covers everything it's the perfect blood of Jesus and it speaks a better word I'm you know the devil might have words for me people might have words for me but the blood speaks a better word over me so father we just thank you for Jesus Christ we thank you that the God had decided that they would be forever and eternally joined to mankind yes. and I thank you that because of the blood of Jesus spilled yes. for me I am free and I'm delivered and so thank you Jesus for the blood Amen.